all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Welcome everyone. Good morning to this morning's open forum on the future of the internet. We are really, really pleased to welcome you to this uh, UK hosted event this morning at the UN IGF. Um, my name is Rhys Bowen. I'm the uh, Director for International Policy at the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport in the UK. And we have some fantastic panelists uh, in a who I'll introduce in a second. Welcome to us this morning. Uh, it's an early start, so hopefully a few more people will join us as we go through in terms of the structure of today's session, we're going to hear in a second uh, an address from uh, a UK minister setting out our view on this set of issues. Then we're going to have a panel discussion and then an open Q&A. So there'll be an opportunity for audience members to uh, make uh, post questions and answers at the end. And uh, if you want to do that, you can either put that in the Q&A panel in the Zoom function or um, via raising your hand and we'll manage that queue ourselves. So first of all, if I could uh, introduce the names and uh, the names of our panelists this morning. First of all, we have Anriette Esserheisen, Chair of the Internet Governance Forum Multi-Stakeholder Advisory Group. And, uh, and Anriette, good morning to you. Morning, Riz. We have Joanna Galessa, Professor of Law and Internet Governance at the University of Lodz. Good morning, Joanna. Good morning, Riz. Thank you for the kind introduction. And uh, finally, last but very much not least, we have Lise Fuhr, Director General of the European Telecoms Network Operators Association, ETNO. Morning, Lise. Good morning, Riz. Good morning to the rest. Looking forward to our session. Thank you. The future of the internet is a massively important topic for us in the UK. We believe that we're at a critical juncture for maintaining a global interoperable open internet. And it's a really important topic for us to be considering at this conference. In order to uphold an open internet, we think it's really important that governments in particular, as part of a multi-stakeholder community, uh, can no longer be afforded to be behind the curve and must play an active role in ensuring that the, uh, the arrangements that we have benefited from so much over the, last few, over the last few decades remain in place. We need collaboration more than ever, and that's why we think it's important that we're sharing perspectives at uh, forums like the IGF. This topic is one that we have also been uh, driving through uh, our presidency of the G7 this year. I chaired our digital and tech track and the future of the internet and the associated governance issues around. It was a really key theme for our discussions. And we also took that into our events, the Future Tech Forum, which took place in London last week. And we had around 200 people discussing again some of these same topics. So we are keen that we uh, really maintain a very active debate that we share these perspectives and therefore I'm really keen uh, to hear everyone's views today both on the panel and audience members as well. With that I'd like to uh, introduce uh, our minister uh, Mr Chris Philp who's the UK Minister for Technology and the Digital Economy who's going to say a few words by way of an opening address to give a UK perspective on this question before we open up the panel discussion. So I can ask the team to uh, play Mr Philp's message. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction, Rhys, and thank you all for joining us at the UK's Open Forum on the Future of the Internet. Let me first say how pleased I am to be here, albeit virtually. The IGF is a cornerstone in the internet governance ecosystem. It has an essential role in bringing together stakeholders and fostering inclusive policy discussions and influencing national, regional and global action. Today's session on the future of the internet is a critical one, and I am especially pleased to be able to put forward the UK's perspective to spark discussion. Almost half a century on from its first iterations, the internet has reshaped the world as we know it and will continue to do so. At the core of the internet sits the stack of infrastructure and protocols that make up this global network of networks. 
permissionless innovation, openness, decentralization and interoperability have allowed the internet to grow into the indispensable tool it is today. But the principles which have led to the evolution of the global internet are increasingly being challenged. We have seen recent proposals that seek to change and remake the very core of the internet and steer it away from the values of freedom and open societies. We are all of us stakeholders of the internet and have roles in supporting its evolution. And we're better to discuss and build consensus on the future of the internet than right here at the IGF. Over the coming decade, the evolution of the internet will bring opportunities, as long as we can collectively navigate key challenges. The internet must become more inclusive as the digital divide narrows. It has been a great achievement that half of the world's population is online, but there is much more to do to ensure that no one is left behind in the future digital economy. As the next 3 billion users come online, we need to ensure they can join a global internet that reflects our open, free societies and democratic values. Any fragmentation or division of the internet's underlying architecture will constrain and undermine the internet with detrimental effects to global connectivity, prosperity and fundamental freedoms. The internet can become faster and more efficient by using emerging technologies from artificial intelligence to next generation telecommunications, satellite networks and eventually quantum computing. But the innovation and deployment of these new technologies should not lead to further consolidation and control, creating a more centralised internet and giving undue influence to a small group of stakeholders who do not necessarily have our best interests at heart. With these opportunities and challenges ahead, now is the time for stakeholders to come together around the positive values we hold as fundamental for the evolution of the internet. We are keen to work constructively with the wider community here at the IGF in developing and advocating for a new, positive, open and free approach. An approach that allows us to understand nuances and trade-offs and to make informed decisions. At the heart of this vision, we propose there should sit a new framework of economic security, social governance and technical lenses. This approach will help us understand different perspectives and find areas of agreement towards common goals. And let's be clear, working together is essential. There will always be areas of disagreement, but we must all have a shared objective to protect the underlying global network that makes up the internet and which has been such a success. Our five lenses are as follows. First, for our economies, we want to strive for a pro-prosperity internet, spreading economic growth around the globe. We must harness the digital economy by supporting diverse and competitive markets and encouraging responsible and permissionless in innovation. That includes making sure that excessive monopolies don't grow and exploit their position to the detriment of businesses and customers. Secondly, security is critical to make sure the architecture of the internet is resilient and to make sure people are protected and criminals are not able to hide behind things like end-to-end -end encryption. Thirdly, for society, the internet must support democracy and open social values. Stakeholders should work together to improve accessibility and ensure that all users are able to participate online safely. We must close the digital divide. We must have a pro-development internet and promote affordable connectivity to the billions of people globally who still don't have access. Fourthly, for governance, we must consider how we maintain a globally governed internet and we must champion and support the functioning of an inclusive multi-stakeholder governance process because that is how the internet has become so successful today. And finally, technically, we must support a scalable, interoperable and open 
global internet, while maintaining, of course, environmental sustainability and connectivity for increasingly diverse users. These five lenses represent a proactive and hopeful vision, and the UK looks forward to engaging with the multi-stakeholder community to discuss them. To conclude, the story of the internet is still being written. We must work together to ensure it evolves in a manner that reflects our open society values. We must protect the global technical core of the internet, its openness and its interoperability. As the multi-stakeholder community, we need to reinforce key governance fora like the UN IGF, as well as crucial technical fora. For a start, this is the positive change we seek to realise through this vision. Thank you very much for listening and over to you, Rhys, and the panel. Hello again, everyone. For those who have joined during the Minister's address there, my name is Rhys Bowen. I'm the International Director for the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport in London. And that was a message from our Minister, Chris Philp, the Minister for uh, the Digital and Technical Economy. Um, we're now going to move on to our panel discussion now, and I want to uh, first of all explore the theme that Mr. Philp just uh, started to raise there around our values for a positive vision for the future of the internet. Really, really key topic at the heart of, of, of what we're discussing this morning. So I just, I'd like first of all to ask uh, Lise, if I can, what does a positive vision for the future of the internet look like? And what are the core values we're looking to uphold? Lise, great to get your perspective on that. <laughs> Thank you, Riz, and uh, uh, thank you for inviting Edno and asking difficult questions, because I think this is a very uh, difficult one, uh, but I think it's a good one. Um, I very much welcome this speech by uh, Minister Chris Phillip, but I think uh, we agree on many of the aspects that uh, the Internet represents a major opportunity, first and foremost, in in relation to economy, to social opportunities, more than ever uh, when it was uh, developed a, a few uh, or a decade ago. But I, coming from the telco, of course, we also think connectivity is, is, uh, is key to narrowing the digital divide. So we think this is an important step whenever you look at the future internet. And uh, we have seen what uh, great opportunities the internet delivers. Uh, and we also see there are some challenges with security governance infrastructure. But if we look at the future to, to the point of your question, I think the uh, pandemic accelerated some trends that uh, uh, started and, and showed us how we can change the way we live, we work, we learn. We went virtual. So that's, uh, it showed us the potential and it showed how the uh, internet became more embedded in our lives. So I think there are two things to look at when you look at the future of the internet. One is the uh, usage, how the users are using the internet. The other one is in the internet as an infrastructure because there are a lot of uh, machine to machine happening there. Uh, um, so that, that, that needs to be two different ways of viewing the internet. Very quickly, if we look at the, uh, the internet today, we see new uh, requirements for, uh, from the telco side. We see that video is the principal driver of data. So it, it actually uh, are uh, an account for at least 70% of the data traffic in our networks. So video means different ways of treating the internet on a technical level. So there is a lot of content there and uh, the users are using the internet in different ways that they have done before. And if you look at the internet of things, we have seen uh, that today there are uh, around 180 million connected devices in Europe. This is uh, estimated to be 850 million by the end of the decade. So we see a, an increase in uh, internet things and that means that we need to have different ways of using the internet. We need low latency, we need uh, 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 a lot of bandwidth, but also the IP uh, um, architecture is important here. And, and we talked about the fragmentation of the internet. For me, uh, when you look to, uh, into machine to machine, I think 
we have IPv4 now, and we also have IPv6, we need to move into IPv6. So we have a lot of, of things that are technical on the internet, a lot of uh, governmental say, uh, governance structures that need to be uh, in place. And looking at the future of the internet, I think uh, it shows us we need to push for the connection of, of everyone because it becomes super important for our daily lives to be connected. But it's also more uh, crucial than ever that we can trust the internet. Uh, the users need to be able to trust it. Uh, that is both on misinformation, disinformation wise, so how we deal with that on the internet is important, but also the security and resilience is, uh, is important. So I think these will need to be the guiding principles, both from the change of use, where uh, we see users are uh, using it for schools, for uh, jobs, for uh, private uh, lives, but also uh, that the machines are gonna be uh, using it as an infrastructure. Thank you. Thanks very much, Lise. Uh, great to hear your view and um, particularly struck by your point on, on connectivity. That was actually a, a theme that came to the Future Tech Forum very strongly last, uh, last week in London, that as well as a core values proposition, the connectivity proposition is also crucially important for, for, for what we're trying to achieve here. Um, I'm also really interested in the machine versus sort of human interaction on the internet and, and the different uses for that. And I think what that might mean for the kind of values we're trying to embody in, in, in the internet is a really interesting kind of challenge. And then trust is something that we, I think, see absolutely core to, uh, to, 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 to our value set, certainly in the UK, and something that we're doing quite a lot of work on around disinformation. Um, I'd like to, if I can, bring in Joanna at, the, at this stage. So um, we've heard both from Chris Phil and Lise there about some of the different perspectives and different aspects we can look at uh, internet governance and how we can think about uh, what we're trying to achieve in sort of in, in um, um, going forward in the future. So I'd be interested, Joanna, to be your perspective on how we can draw on the different lenses, the different perspectives of what we're trying to achieve through uh, through our internet policy for a more rounded debate on the internet's future, Joanna. Thank you very much, Liz. Indeed, these four elements, these four lenses that you focus on in that intervention are crucial to the further development of the multi-stakeholder model and the one world, one internet paradigm that we have developed thus far. I particularly welcome the reference to security. Indeed, meeting as we are now in the hybrid format, ensuring safe communications is paramount. I welcome the emphasis on security. I would, however, highlight that the way we have looked at the norms-based order, as we like to refer to it in these international relations or international law conversations, includes both security and individual rights. So when we look at a norms-based order in the perspective of international law as we know it, we look at both national sovereignty we do have a lot of panels during this IGF on cyber sovereignty, digital sovereignty, and keeping a state safe and state infrastructure safe is indeed paramount. I would be very cautious though with the reference, for example, to encryption as a tool that enables crime. It is broadly recognized that encryption, the right to encryption in itself could be perceived as a human right, particularly when you look at governments that abuse surveillance technologies I'm going to use the very recent advancements on the way that the Pegasus software is being distributed with Poland being put on a blacklist by the distributors. You could also see here this element of private governance where it is indeed a private company that sets the standard for the use of surveillance technologies. So with this, I also welcome the reference of, um, to, to governance, the paradigms we have for governance as indeed it is largely private companies that tell us which is allowed and which is not. Now, putting the focus on security, national sovereignty, complemented by human rights, I'm going to make a strong argument for the application of international law as we know it in cyberspace. The exercises within the UN, both the UNGG and the open-ended working group in their reports have emphasized that international law applies to cyberspace as it is, as it stands. We would largely not need a new regime, even though these proposals are being put on a table. Why is that? 
the comparisons, for example, to the law of the sea or outer space are failed because these regimes followed a long-standing customary practice. The internet needs to reference the standing principles of state responsibility due diligence as we know them in international law and human rights law, including individual rights to privacy or freedom of expression is also directly applicable there too. I want to make one, another, one other point. Um, when we talk about international law and how it applies to cyberspace, I'm going to argue we do have a standing framework that we can fall back on that you guys refer to as the core values. That is something we have developed after the Second World War. But there's also an element of capacity building that I believe you reference with uh, your lens on the society, where we need to make sure that we enable internet access also through the soft skills to building competence and a comprehensive approach to capacity building as has been developed by various communities uh, just to mention the GFC, which is hosting a panel during this IGF as well, but also within ICANN, where Nigel and myself have had the opportunity to work together, representing both end users and governments working together locally to best develop the capacities of individual end users, as those today joining us from Abuja, this is lovely to have remote help there. That is the second crucial element that I believe complements what you guys refer to as the core values. So these are most welcome, whereas this balancing exercise between different interests is definitely something we need to focus on. That would be my initial intervention. Thank you for giving me the floor. Joanna, thank you very much. And I, I think it's really important. I mean, some of the high level titles we have here, economy, security, society, governance, technology, I suspect we all recognize that those are things that are important here, but it's actually getting underneath that, understanding the kind of tensions and the kind of choices and trade offs underneath it, which I think is really where the heart of this conversation is. So thank you for giving an insight into aspects of that. Um, I'm going to turn to Henrietta now, and, and Henriette, b b before we go on to the second part of the discussion, I want to give you the opportunity to comment on this values part of, of, of what we've been focusing on, um, whether, you know, what, what, you, what your view is around a positive vision for the internet, what are the core values we need to uphold, how do we ensure that we can bring all these perspectives together into the debate? Do you would you like to comment on that before we move on to the second question? Um, I would really like to, in fact, Reese, I was thinking of asking you if I could. Um, I think we really are at a critical juncture, and I think that's why it's so important that, that governments and others are thinking about what these values are. I think we, we at a point where um, we know we want to preserve the interoperability of the internet. Um, we know we want to preserve its, its, its global nature. Um, but we also know that if we don't protect the public core, and by the public core, I mean the infrastructure, the domain name system, but I also mean the publicness of the internet, the internet as an open platform for, for innovation and, and for participation, we'll lose, I think, this, the, the power of the internet. And I think that's very challenging because it does require policy, it does require some kind of regulatory approach, it does require looking at things like taxation, um, looking at antitrust, um, but looking at these in a very delicate and I think evidence-based way so that you do not end up um, uh, you know, with the, with the, the sledgehammer approach to, to, to uh, doing this. But I think aside from the values of human rights, of openness and inclusion and collaboration, for me, this idea of the publicness of the internet um, is absolutely vital. I think we need to always recall and remember that, that, that what is, that the internet itself is a platform, it's an interoperable platform. And the behaviors that we are finding challenging with the internet, both from the corporate sector, from governments who shut down the internet, from, from people who use the internet for harmful use, those behaviors are not the internet. And I think that for me is a value that we should pre preserve as well, is that any kind of regulatory or policy intervention to, to, to preserve the internet for positive use needs to target those behaviors and the actors who perpetrate those behaviors, not the internet itself as an open um, interoperable network. So yes, that's a bit of a, um, but, and I think just the final thing, and you've said it yourself, and, 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 so, and so did we here in the opening remarks, the inclusion is important. I think the internet as a platform um, for uh, a 
connected world um, does require the unconnected to be connected in a meaningful way. And, you know, it's a little bit like we'll never kill COVID until we have more and more people vaccinated. And I think the value of the internet is really compromised by the fact that so many people are still not able to, to use it. And that is not just a digital divide issue. It's a social and economic divide issue. So I think um, we need to keep that on our agendas as well. How do we try and create societies around the world that are more equal at a fundamental level and by being more equal at an economic and social level, enables, enables more equal participation in the internet. Andrea, thank you very much. I'm going to move on now to question two. I'm going to stay with you and, and react to start off with. We'll take uh, contributions perhaps in reverse order of our panelists. So we wanted to go on just to explore and perhaps a slightly more sort of practical perspective. Mm -hmm. What are the forums and collaboration necessary to uphold an open global interoperable internet? One of the, uh, I guess, characteristics of the internet as a relatively decentralized kind of entity is that there is a whole variety of, of, of different fora um, and then moving, I guess, into the standard development organizations that contribute to this, to this whole. And therefore trying to uh, sort of plot a path from a from, I guess, from a government perspective at least, in how we can uh, sort of try to influence the overall system to embody the values we want mm -hmm. is, is an interesting practical question. So I would just like to ask you, perhaps, Andrea, to start off with, what, what, um, from your perspective, where are the critical forums and spaces for collaboration in upholding a positive vision for the internet? Where can we act to help the multi-stakeholder governance ecosystem be more resilient to change? Um, Rhys, thanks for that. Um, that's a question that becomes increasingly challenging to respond to because, as you say, the internet uh, and internet governance continues to diversify and be more distributed. I chaired an open forum yesterday of United Nations, Nations agencies and their involvement in internet governance. And it was remarkable that, you know, just within the UN system, from counterterrorism to disarmament research, to social and economic development, to countering online gender-based violence, just in the UN system, they are struggling to actually exchange information and collaborate. So I think what we have to accept is that um, internet governance is distributed, it's multidisciplinary and it's multi-stakeholder. So there are no easy solutions. There are multiple spaces. Johanna mentioned international law. International law means we have to engage the treaty bodies. We have to work with the Human Rights Council and with the treaty bodies that, that oversee the major conventions on human rights. Similarly, climate change is increasingly also looking at internet governance related issues. So the intergovernmental space remains important. And I think particularly when we're looking at the openness of the internet and the internet as a space where human rights are protected and defended. It's very important that governments negotiate around that and, and, and do peer reviews on protection and observance of human rights in, in those intergovernmental spaces. And, and that's just one sphere. Regional spaces are very important. We're looking at the moment what, at what's happening with initiatives to introduce more regulation of internet industry and companies. Europe is obviously leading that, um, but it's happening elsewhere as well. And ensuring that there's regional collaboration on that and that it's multi-stakeholder, I think is very important if we are wanting to avoid these, these regulatory uh, approaches um, becoming, um, creating more barriers than they are enabling. And then at national level, I think national level is extremely important and needs to be approached with a cautious, uh, through in quite a cautious way, because if you have um, too much fragmentation and national approaches to, to, to internet governance, you could undermine um, the interconnectedness and the commonness of internet governance and the internet ultimately being understood and governed as uh, at, at, at a global level. And I think local spaces are extremely important, and particularly when we're looking at bridging the access divide in, in developing countries, bringing in local government, or even uh, traditional authorities in rural areas, building community networks, you know, in a bottom up way. So, so it is very diverse, but, and then industry level um, engagement and um, self-regulation, co-regulation, setting of standards, also very important. But ultimately to come back to the IGF, I think what the IGF 
does. I think it actually becomes more and more important in this immensely distributed and complex internet governance ecosystem, because our, our IGFs, be it the global one, regional IGFs or national IGFs, really become the spaces where we can come together and, and engage this complexity, learn more about it, um, and, and, and try and solve problems together. Um, and I think just, you know, in my last comment on this, I think what I would really like us to see, and I think some people are already doing it, is, but is to use these multi-stakeholder spaces, not just for easy consensus, you know, not just to all sit around the table and say, we like the internet, the internet's important. You know, I'm being a bit facetious, but I think we sometimes do tend to avoid using our multi-stakeholder fora to really work through difference, different approaches, different interests to conflict. Um, and if we don't, I think we actually will undermine the power of the multi-stakeholder approach. Back to you, Rhys. Thank you very much, Amriat. And I, I think your last challenge there is a particularly apt one, and one we might want to just develop a little bit more. I'm going to talk. I'm, I'm going to talk, turn to Joanna next, just to come back on on the same question um, around the spaces and critical forums that are necessary for us to work together in, in order to uphold our positive vision. Perhaps one other aspect I maybe just ask you perhaps to, to consider, Joanna, is, 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 is the sort of point that this is a, a world that is evolving very quickly in terms of the internet itself, but um, international governance quite often takes longer to actually catch up in, in, in all areas. Now, how do we manage in this space that, that, uh, that differential between a very quickly evolving technical space um, but a, a, an international governance piece by its distributed nature that takes a little while to kind of react. Let me hand over to you and get, and get your perspective on this question. Thank you very much, Rhys. That is indeed the crucial question. If I had a comprehensive and workable answer to that question, I believe I could easily solve most of the world's problems. So I don't think there's an easy fix to this. The multi-stakeholder approach we have to internet governance we still believe is the best way we can do this uh, this uh, challenging job because the internet is so complex i'm not going to go back to the technicalities and the layers and the lasagnas and the spaghettis we're trying to manage here however we still agree that looking at three groups of stakeholders the governments included is the only way we can move forward now having said this references to international law are forever more increasing I have been at this job for quite a while now. And when I started, international law was not something you would naturally use for internet governance. You would sometimes reference international relations. You would at times also try to use different paradigms from different areas of international law and international relations. But international law was not the tool itself. However, it seems as if governments are showing increasing interest uh, in regulating cyberspace with international law. The one thing that seems to be missing in these debates is that they do not do this alone. So this is not a challenge that governments can individually solve with law. With that in mind, all of the fora that Henriette mentioned, or all of the regions, the spaces that we need to keep in mind are absolutely valid. I would not say that there is one a, a quick fix that we could use to solve this challenge. I would rather say we need to keep pushing forward, keeping in mind the same objective, the interconnectivity, the openness, the permissionless innovation that you guys emphasize so strongly. Something that we have not yet addressed is, for example, the copyright challenge. When you look at different copyright regimes, the European one is quite restrictive. We are meeting in Europe, so I'm going to use it as an example. So what we might want to keep in mind is the overall objective of keeping the internet open and a whole, as opposed to uh, national cyberspaces being protected with national laws. So indeed, using the forms we have within the UN, within the ITU, but also the so-called technical internet governance with the policies and standards of the IETF, of ICANN, is something we need to keep in mind. So effectively, what this comes down to for governments and civil society actors alike is just keeping your eyes open to all the changes as they advance, um, pushing this uh, vehicle forward one step at a time without uh, causing permanent damage to the way that these infrastructures are being 
um, are being managed. So I don't think I have an easy, easy fix there, this. I don't think anyone does. But at the same time, we have so many forums and we see to be able to identify the far reaching perspective we want to obtain, as you guys noted um, in your statement, with the internet remaining open and um, permissionless uh, for innovation, if you will. Uh, so that is something we need to keep in mind and just uh, keeping the conversations going as we do at the IGF. Not a very practical response, but I don't think there is a, a better one at this point. Thank you for putting the question forward, though, Reese. Joanna, thank you very much. And I'm going to turn now to Lisa, if I can, for your perspective on the, on the same question. Um, I'm really interested, I guess, from an industry perspective. Uh, you you are obviously part of this as a as a, a multi-stakeholder participant, but also part of this as somebody who is uh, you know representing companies who are effectively delivering um, large aspects of the internet connectivity that we all rely on, and therefore um, are looking for. Kind of practical solutions as well as as well as kind of broader governance conversations. So, Lisa, what's what's your perspective about the key uh, organisations, the key spaces we need to be focusing on in order to ensure that the positive vision we've just started to describe is made a reality? Yeah, thank you for the question, Riz, and I, I agree. There are no easy solutions to this. What I would like to bring in, which is a bit. Uh, um, Tricky is what we see now here in Brussels is that uh, we have regulation coming in, taking over the Digital Service Act, the Digital Market Act. And while this seems far away from uh, internet governance and also IGF, I believe this will actually influence part of what we're talking about today in, in maybe five years time, because this will uh, change the way some of the market players are behaving on the internet and the way we use the internet, it will change uh, the way services are delivered. And um, I think it's important uh, we have the multi-stakeholder model as we're having here with IGF and also with ICANN. But I also think it's important, and we said this last year, that we have all stakeholders around the table. And this is where it becomes difficult because these discussions we're having today are quite uh, um, difficult just to step into. They are either very technical or very uh, much into the internet lingo. So we need to make sure that when we talk about inclusion, we talk about inclusion in a broader sense. Um, as a telco, we, of course, are extremely depending on standards. So when you talk about the internet and you talk about uh, governance, back to the point posted by Henriette saying she forgot to underline the importance of technical governance, that is, is, is key too. So, so talking about uh, um, important critical forum or fora, I think there are many. I think the IETF is important. I think ICANN is important. I think IGF is important. But what I like about these uh, parts is that they are multi-stakeholder. And that gives us, uh, again, the dilemma. I think Joanna mentioned it. We have a, a fast moving technology. We have a slow governance model. But I, I believe we need to deal with this and, and we cannot uh, um, leave someone out of these discussions because this is extremely important. And that's back a bit, uh, also to the public core uh, that Henriette was talking about that needs to be preserved. Yes, it needs to be preserved and it needs to be uh, also allowed to develop. So we need to have this preserve the uh, core values, but also allow for uh, new innovations because otherwise we get stuck in, in the old uh, models. But from my side, whatever is defined um, both on in IGF, but also the more uh, standard uh, bodies is depending or will uh, define how we deal with security, how we deal with the infrastructure, how we deal with the services on the internet. Uh, so we need to see it all in cohesion. We need to see it uh, uh, all as interconnected and interrelated. Uh, so whenever we talk uh, human rights, we also need to talk standards. Whenever we talk open uh, access, we also need to talk technology. So everything is uh, uh, interconnected 
And this is what makes it difficult for everyone to, to understand <laughs> because we always sit either with the uh, legal part, the uh, human part, the technical part, but we need, we, we need to make sure these are meeting each other. And again, uh, back to uh, Joanna, I'm, I'm not giving any solutions, but from our side, I think we often forget the technical uh, parts, the technical standards and those bodies in discussing all of this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elise. Um, really, really useful to get that perspective and um, also drawing on, 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 on Amriat's point about the technical side of governance as well, I think it is crucially important. I'm gonna just sort of make a few closing remarks of, this part of the uh, forum this morning. And we're going to go to questions from uh, the audience in a second. I see quite a few have come in already. So I will I'll try to bring colleagues in in just a second. Um, we've had a really useful discussion today. And thank you very much for everyone's contributions. I think the, uh, the importance of a kind of core value set around uh, internet governance, I think is something that everyone on the panel sort of agrees with, but uh, there's some sort of nuances I just want to bring out. I mean, I think that the point around connectivity and, and the importance of ensuring that those who are not currently part of, of, of the internet community become so, I think is a really, a really important point that's been emphasized by, by a number of different panelists. I think one of the other aspects I really wanted to, to draw out was Lisa's point around um, so sort of now, but also particularly going forward, the fact that uh, there'll be many different users of the internet, including actually non-humans, as it were, and that, and, and that kind of internet as an infrastructure perspective, internet as a as a as a way of connecting together machines, as as, as well as humans, is something we should consider more around. And then I think the piece that uh, Amriette just challenges at the end of her intervention, right at the, on the end of the first question, that as well as using, uh, in, you know, we have a lot of, we have a lot we agree on, and it's important that we kind of, uh, you know, do consolidate that and ensure that that consensus is kind of recognised. But actually, there are also some some uh, areas where there's a lot of debate and challenge, and we should use our multi-stakeholder fora for those issues, um, because those are the issues we actually need to work through as a community. And I, I think that's a good challenge for for all of us. In terms of the second question, I think everyone on the panel kind of recognised the importance of the multi-stakeholder approach, despite its limitations around speed and, 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 and sometimes the kind of disaggregated nature of it actually makes it, it, it quite difficult to kind of cohere. But I think there, you know, th th there are clearly challenges to it. We talked around speed in general. Um, again, Lisa at the end sort of particularly talked about the fact it needed to ensure that innovation was kind of maintained. And I think that's that's something that we, we absolutely need to consider further. And so I think as we as we consider how how these structures work and particularly how they work together. I think it's preserving some of those kind of objectives we have almost sort of meta objectives for the whole system around promoting innovation, promoting values. That's, that, that's, that, that's very important for us. With that, I'm going to now sort of turn to, uh, turn to our audience and um, ask for some questions. Uh, I have to say, and I will apologize now, it is slightly difficult from where I am and the information I have to make sure I'm bringing everyone in, in turn. So, uh, I hope I will do that. If I don't, by any chance, and please forgive me. But I'm going to start off by bringing in Andrew Campling um, to make an observation or, 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 or question. Andrew, please. Hi there. Good morning. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Yes, we can. Please introduce yourself, Andrew. Yeah, fantastic. Hi. Uh, uh, yeah, my name is Andrew Campling, um, and uh, uh, I'm involved in public policy and public affairs in, in the uh, tech sector. And uh, uh, I posted a couple of questions in, in the chat, and then I realised that there was indeed a raise hand function. So I will briefly summarise the two questions. Uh, firstly, just sort of continuing the discussion on internet governance. Um, I. I I am concerned that uh, a lot the internet standards bodies are effectively dominated by the large tech uh, companies. Um, so although they are notionally open, um, the people in the room are primarily from, from, from the tech sector. Um, this sort of the, the voice of the end user is rarely heard. Um, and governments are largely absent from the, the room with one or two uh, notable exceptions. Um, uh, likewise, regulators uh, and, and other 
of others of the multi-stakeholder community. Uh, so first question is, how can we get greater participation but, uh, by the multi-stakeholder community in standard setting? Because a lot of the, the standards bodies ignore the public policy uh, impacts of their standards choices. So if the multi-stakeholders aren't in the room, then potentially bad impacts will happen um, and will be, won't even be discussed, uh, uh, let alone um, avoided. Uh, so that'd be the first question. Then very briefly, second question, um, the start of the conversation, um, uh, there were references to uh, the importance of encryption. Um, I, I wonder if occasionally uh, people are overweighting the importance uh, or, or the priority of encryption uh, as it relates to uh, and pr privacy um, uh, and, and the benefits that that, that gives to communication um, and completely ignoring the right uh, to privacy um, uh, and safety, indeed, uh, of the victims of, of, of crimes such as child sex abuse. And how do we balance those conflicting rights? Because at the moment, a lot of the conversation seems to focus purely on the rights uh, of, of people communicating and ignoring some of the harms uh, that, that are caused. Thanks, Rhys. Thank you very much, Andrew. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pose that first question if I can around how do we ensure there is the fullest range of perspectives in the governance and standards making process to Henriette, if I can. And then I'm going to ask the question around uh, encryption and how do we balance the, the, the different rights at, uh, at stake here. First of all, I think to Joanna, if I can, and I might also ask Lisa for perspective on that as well. But Henriette, if I may, can I ask you just to speak about Andrew's first question? Um, thanks, Rhys. Um, Andrew, you're absolutely right. And, I, you know, if we want to use this multi-stakeholder model right, we do have to get the right people in the room. And they won't always be the same people. It depends on what we are discussing. So, so this notion of multi-stakeholder, which is simply bringing business, technical community, civil society, government um, together is not enough. We need to analyze the issue and make sure the right stakeholders and the right individuals and institutions are in the room. But Andrew, actually, I think you'll be surprised to see who is in the room. And I think over time, what we've seen at the IGF is that the big internet companies are sending fewer people um, to global IGFs. Um, in fact, I think some of them, US-based ones, are spending much more time in Washington, DC, talking to the Senate or to Congress than they are talking to global multi-stakeholder fora. And that's been a big shift. 10 years ago, it looked very different. And I think that's a reflection of the changes in trends uh, to, internet, uh, to internet policy or trends in approaches to internet policy. I think what I have seen over time um, is that the two stakeholder groups who, from my perspective, remain the most solidly committed um, to this um, are the um, civil society and governments. I think the technical community is the glue that is so critical. And I have seen over time as well how some of the big technical governance institutions, and this is to some extent a challenge to them, like the Internet Society and ICANN, for example, uh, the IETF and, and the other standard setting and uh, protocol development bodies, they participate, they follow, but we need a stronger presence from them. We need institutions like ETNO and we have them, but we need more. Um, and I think, Andrew, that is very important. I think that we continue to make sure that that cross-fertilization that can only happen if you have the devil in the detail <laughs> allowed to surface in the multi-stakeholder space and then you attack or interrogate that devil from a multi-stakeholder uh, perspective so you're very right but I think you would be surprised to see that this notion and I think many people make the assumption that the large internet companies have captured the multi-stakeholder spaces that's certainly not my experience anymore and I think what I really am very impressed by as someone from civil society is um, effort from government and I've seen that increased um, over time of course there are governments I come from Africa there are governments that shut down the internet when there's an election and they fear the use of social media uh, would threaten their power and we also have governments in the UN system who do not support the multi-stakeholder approach but what I've seen actually is so much positive examples of governments becoming more invested in this approach and I think that's very hopeful but we need the technical community in the room as well. 
Andrea, thank you very much. Let me turn, if I can, to uh, Joanna to talk about the second question about how we balance the respective rights here. And uh, Andrew obviously used the, the example of encryption as a key topic of, of debate. Um, that is an ongoing debate. I'm certain both Andrew and the panelists know this to be the pertaining question with regard how to, to balancing human rights online. And whenever we have a debate around prioritizing both security and privacy, it's usually someone from law enforcement and comes up and asks the question of whether you would, you, you would allow someone who had abused your own child to hide behind encryption or whether you would rather agree for the police to have the keys to encryption to protect your child. Now that is an emotional argument that is often used and we debate it. So this is an ongoing discussion. If I was to give you my personal insight on how we might want to find a solution to that, I would probably fall back on the general principles of international law or national law how to manage a society in a fair manner. So it is about transparency. It is about building trust. I've talked to my colleagues from the Netherlands who say that they have a very reliable national system of governmental control over law enforcement that is transparent. The society trusts the commission that is there set up by the parliament that supervises the law enforcement and the surveillance industry, if you will. So there seems to be a certain balance between transparency and effectiveness of national law enforcement that allows them to use certain surveillance technologies. I have called this out before and I don't want to turn this into a political debate, but in Poland recently, since we are meeting hybrid in Katowice, there was a debate around the use of Pegasus. I did mention that before. And there's a private company that offers that service to certain countries and doesn't offer it to others. Central European countries have just been blacklisted a few weeks ago. So you can see that the question of transparency, reliance, trust towards those who use surveillance technologies at the cost of encryption, to me, is crucial to the answer of that question. I don't have a universal one. I'm going to argue that encryption is a human right. We have a right to privacy. That is something that was recommended by the European Parliament at the face of the Snowden revelations. If you know you're being surveilled, encrypt your communications. So I'm going to stick with that answer. But I do agree that there can be exceptions, which every country, every society needs to revise for themselves, install institutions that will protect individual rights and use those surveillance technologies in a responsible manner. That's going to be my answer. But I do sense a potential for a coffee break discussion, which we'll probably not have. But when we meet face to face again, I will pick up that topic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joanna. What I'm going to do now, Lisa, I'm actually not going to come to you now. What I'm going to do is ask our moderator to bring just a, maybe two questions in from the, the wider chat, given the time you have available, and then I'll bring you in on one of those. So maybe I could turn to Nigel just to uh, raise a couple of questions we've had from our audience. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Nigel Hickson here. The, the, the first one was from uh, Colin, uh, Colin Hayhurst, and he asks, uh, web search is controlled uh, with, uh, le uh, with more than 99% of market share in the UK and many other countries. Uh, the minister says he doesn't want to see monopolies grow, uh, doesn't want to see uh, monopolies uh, grow. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, and given that much of the proposed regulation like the online safety bill in the UK is, is welcomed by the, uh, the main uh, platforms, how, uh, how will the UK and other countries demand that US regulators act decisively against these US uh, oligop sorry, <laughs> oligopolies? That was the uh, first question. And the, the, the other question, which uh, I, I, I think is, is, is good for a last question in, in some senses, is, is from Virin, Virinder Singh. And he, he, he notes that, uh, that given the dynamic nature of this market and the trends in the internet market, how can those in their 35s to 40 year olds, not least us older ones, can keep uh, updated with the digital advances with a view to providing quality advice and uh, information, etc. Thank you very much. 
Thanks very much, Nigel. On that first question, I suspect that might be um, a more government focused question, but let, so let me just make a small remark myself and then I, I might bring in others. And the second question I'm going to bring Lise to, to just to try to, un, to, to help us un, understand that perspective. In terms of the government policy question, I think the, um, the global debate around um, about digital competition and about the policy response to that, I think has become much more active in the last two years, I would say. We have legislation particularly around online competition coming through in the EU, in the UK, some other ju ju jurisdictions and various proposals for legislation in the US as well. So I think, I think that set of areas has become much more active. From the G7 perspective, we uh, did include a kind of discussion on this through our through our strand this this year, and one of the outcomes of that was for G7 competition regulators to uh, to come together to to see how they can enhance their cooperation, which also picks up some of early discussion around coordination here, and that actually took place in London last week. So Lena Khan from the US. Uh, joined uh, the Future Tech Forum for a part of last week, but then um, you know was in quite intensive discussions. I know with with global competition kind of leads. So I think I think this is an area where policy is quite active. I think over the next kind of eighteen months, my guess will be is we will see some um, some relatively significant kind of legislative initiatives come to fruition in a number of different jurisdictions, and then I think we will you know we will see the consequence of that kind of subsequently. So um, I guess I guess my kind of answer from a government policy making perspective is I think this is an area which is very active and kind of watch this space. Um, on on the second question, let me turn to you, Lise, and 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 talk about how how uh, people in general can kind of stay stay up to up to date with the issues here. Well, it, it is a very uh, very difficult question because you uh, if you look at the internet, there are many trends. There are the the technical trends. There are also the if you look at social media, how you use content, and 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 the more uh, the big platforms like Facebook, uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, and others, uh, and and not to to forget uh, all the the new ones that are popping up all the time, and and uh, some are becoming uh, more youth focused than others. Uh, what what we try to do as uh, as many of the members of of Edno is to try and. Um, and educate people just to have different ways of, of, of giving uh, information about both security, but also be, be careful on, on how you use the internet, but to don't be afraid of using the internet. Uh, that's for us an important message. How to keep up with the, uh, the trends. It is as impossible today as it was a hundred years ago when the youth would, was the one delivering all the, the new and the new innovations, etc. I don't think there is a one fix it all to, to this. Either you, you go in those places, you, you either use LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, Facebook, etc., or uh, it, and learn from that, or you, you try to. Um, focus yourself towards uh, the technical part. But to me, <laughs> uh, that's a, a super tricky question, honestly. It is. Thank you so much for trying to answer it, Lisa. Appreciate that. Um, I'm conscious we are almost out of time, so I'm going to wrap up now. Um, first and foremost, thank you to everybody who's joined the discussion this morning or this afternoon, depending where you are. Um, it's, uh, it's a really, really important topic, and I'm grateful for your engagement around it. Um, I'd like to thank our hosts in Poland who have put on um, this fantastic IGF event and have been so flexible and agile in moving to a, a more hybrid format as uh, we've all experienced challenges around uh, different aspects of coronavirus and the regulations around it. I'd like to particularly thank our three panelists uh, this morning. Uh, Anriette Esterheisen, Chair of the Internet Governance Forum's Multi-Stakeholder Advisory Group, thank you to you. To Joanna Kalesa, Professor of Law and Internet Governance at the University of Lodz. And to Lise Fuhrer, Director General of ETNO, the European Telecommunications Network Operators Association. So thank you, thank you to all of you for joining us this morning. Um, 
we'd like to just you know finally sort of emphasize that you know this is obviously a, a very quick discussion on a massively important topic and you know we are committed and, and we think it's really important that we continue to work together towards a positive vision for the future of the internet based on open society values we're really grateful from a UK perspective that this debate is, is becoming uh, a more active one and one that we are very keen to participate in going forward. And we welcome a lot of the kind of shared views that have been uh, raised this month today, both around what we're trying to achieve and also some of the challenges around doing it. And we look forward to working with you all and partners right across the UN community going forward as, uh, as, as, we, try to, uh, as we try to ensure that what comes next to the internet delivers the absolute best for uh, the societies that we're all part of and we represent. Thank you very much for your contributions this morning and I hope you enjoy the other aspects of the conference. Thank you. Thank you.